Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Bakar Benu Mekol Haami Venatam Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. And I apologize, I didn't get my scarf, but that's okay. It's in the box. Well, you know, thanks. We need to really remember a couple of things. You know, Ravik, uh, Vaikra, and we need to remember that it's on the last syllable, so it's not by Vaikra or anything else. It's Vaikra, right? Rabah 7.3 says, why do we start the children with Vaikra and not with Bereshit? The Holy One, blessed be he, said, since the children are pure and the sacrifices are pure, let the pure come and occupy themselves with things that are pure. Now, we don't think of that when we think of the book of Aikra. Most of us go, oh, my gosh, here we go again. Right? I mean, everybody knows Aikra 23. Yes, that's our standard. But when all the rest of you are going, you know, the grain, the goats, the, the bulls, you know, come on. How many bulls can you give it a sacrifice? You know? But there's something hidden. We have a hidden truth in there that we really need to get at. When our master Yeshua was five years old, he began to study the book of Aikra. Now, in the days of the master and even in modern Judaism today, the formal religious education of a child begins at the age of five and with the book of Aikra. Now, I've got a first grade great grandchild and she's six but when she was five if I sat her down and said we're going to study the book of Aikra and we're going to kill goats and sheep and lambs and on and on and on she would have looked at me and said you got to be kidding me I'm <laughs> going to go watch YouTube right but we have to remember that the creation narrative the story of the flood and the call of Abraham might seem like a better place for a child to begin. And that's what we do. We begin in the stories. But nevertheless, throughout Jewish history, children began their Bible studies with the book of Vayikra. So why should the little children be forced to study the dreadful laws of blood and sacrifice, which constitute the first chapter of Vayikra? I mean, you know, we... We don't let them watch violence on television, but yet we teach them Vaikra, correct? It's like, hmm, we got it wrong. We got it wrong. Even, you know, I wouldn't impose the study of Vaikra. Well, it isn't imposed, even in Bible college. I went three years to Bible college, and we never, never studied the book of Vaikra. Right? Very sad. We did read a book called The, the uh, Scarlet Thread, and which is really great. You know, it follows the blood all the way through, but it doesn't address Vaikra. We didn't even study Vaikra 23, you know, the Moedim, right? And that was Bible college. So why should we do that to our children? Well, our aversion to Vaikra is largely based upon our personal revulsion, right, of the thought of an animal sacrifice. The mainstream Christian, mainstream Christianity, possesses an unconscious reluctance to acknowledge that our God is a God who not only chose to be worshipped through sacrifice of animals, but in, in fact, he took pleasure in the sweet aroma of burning meat. And it was right as it was rising from the altar. He took pleasure in this. And we've so sanitized and whitewashed God that the demand for animal sacrifices seems to contradict absolutely everything that we believe about him. Did you think about that? 
it doesn't are it it um it it uh imposes a a uh, negative impression of our god so we just don't study it we don't learn about it we don't think about that you know this is not a negative impression it's a sweet aroma to our god when the biblical text begins to teach us about priests throwing blood around and cutting up the meat right and taking out the fat and all of that kind of thing we quickly explain god only intended the sacrifices excuse me to teach the israelites about the need for messiah's atonement and we comfort ourselves with the notion that the brit hadashah abolishes all sacrifice we want to whitewash it right well we believe mashiach in the some sense fulfills the sacrifice but you know that that's a gross statement makes excuse me that that statement makes a gross oversimplification and that's your fill-in. The Mashiach fulfills the, sac fulfills the sacrifice is really a gross oversimplification. Now, the first several chapters of Iequa present five different categories of sacrifices. And each category contains numerous variations, each one brought for many different reasons. And the Bible speaks of dozens of different bread offerings, wine libations, and other offerings, complex ritual procedures. And it has chapters and chapters and chapters of text describing sacrificial ceremonies, procedures for ordaining the priests, and instructions for their sanctification and purification. The Torah is never stingy on details concerning ritual services. We've all noticed that. How many times have we gone through the five books and have read over and over and over the rituals and the ceremonies that God really instructed his people to give? Well, of what value was it for us to profess that Mashiach fulfills the sacrifices when we know virtually nothing about those same sacrifices? Or we put a stamp on it. That was Old Testament stamp on it that was before messiah stamp on it right it doesn't affect us now well first of all you know this does such a great disservice to the text and to our master himself if we truly believe that yeshua's death and resurrection fulfilled the institutions of sacrifice and sacrificing then we as believers are all the more obligated to invest our energy in studying these instructions. For only to the extent that we understand them can we hope to understand the work of Messiah. Just like the tabernacle, you really don't understand God's plan from the very beginning unless you understand the Mishkan. Correct, those that took the class? Yeah. Shake your head? Okay, yes. As we begin to study the laws of sacrifice, we need to keep in mind that regardless of our own personal preferences or our own personal beliefs, the sacrifice of that sacrificial service is the method of worship that God intended. Now, sacrifice is a universal religious reflex human beings seem hardwired to recognize their need for atonement in the face of the divine and that's your a sacrifice is a universal religious reflex human beings seem hardwired to recognize their need for atonement in the face of the divine Consider the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Sacrificing the beginning of humanity, right? Consider, too, that sacrifice in one form of another was, was done throughout history. We can see sacrifice done in Central America. We can see it done in Great, Great Britain. We can see it done in Mexico. We can see it done in Central America, correct? We even see it done in some uh, places here in the United States. Can you believe that? That we did that. And that these ancient cultures practiced the ritual of sacrifice to whatever they worship. 
we went to Central America and went to some of the, the ruins and some of the, the pyramids down there. And their sacrificial system was very unique, very precise, and just, just a little, I'm, I'm gonna give you a seed to go home and look at, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know that God put the blood and the importance of the blood in every single nation, tribe, and ethnic group in the world? The Mayans, I'm going to get off a little bit here. What they would do is that there, once a year, their king, their ruler, would go to the top of the pyramid and he, they would have a bowl and they would cut his tongue and the blood from the tongue would go in to the bowl and he would pull the bowl on the altar. And when he did that, he sacrificed his blood for a good year to come and blessings upon his people. Do you see the connection? Yeah. Every single, every single ethnic group, God put the blood into. And he said, it is so important. You know, the Torah puts form and structure and definition around this God-given impulse. Whether we approve of the rituals or we think that they are that they are rationally and largely irrelevant. Neither Christian nor Jews can keep any of the commandments pertaining to sacrifice in our time. And if I'm talking too fast, give me a time's out. A couple of points on that too. Once the Christian faith got introduced into South America, they started crucifying on mm -hmm. That's right. And it's also it, important to- The shedding of the blood. It's also important to kind of look at it because the original Sacrifice was for a sweet aroma to that's right. the Father. The Eastern tradition was whenever somebody came to visit or whenever you welcomed somebody into your house, you would sacrifice the fatted calf right. and serve it up for them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, interesting. I was listening uh, to Dennis Prager this week. I like a lot of what he said, yes. but then I hear things that I don't agree with. Um, but he was, he does his, does his talk show and another Jewish lady called in and said, I just really don't understand what the sacrifices are all about. And I was so taken back with his answer because I thought, oh my gosh, he really doesn't understand this yeah. at all. He said, well, it's because there was so much human sacrifice going on that God turned it into animal sacrifice. Oh, oh my God. Oh. Oh. And she bought it, of course. Oh, that makes sense. There is an amazing book out there on... Um, evangelism and evangelizing the world i think that's what it is and it takes how god planted that Do you, okay again gotta take a rabbi trail mm -hmm. okay sure. We're teaching. one <laughs> one of the two of the things that that happens is do you know that when in um africa Two tribes have not been able to get along. And there's been war between those two tribes and they've never gotten along. Do you know how they settle it? A, a son of the chief goes to the son of the, the uh, other chief and they trade back and forth. But how they get there? The women, the women make a tunnel. And the son goes through this tunnel. He is taken from this group. He is born into this group to bring peace. Mm. Oh, wow. Peace child. He's, yeah. he's called a peace child. Absolutely. Yes. When, um, yeah, that was an Aryan guy that really led to a lot of people coming to the Lord before that one. Idol. When I was in uh, Guatemala, I chose not to go to Tikal. Um, there's no spiritual stuff going around, and you know, I'm not sure how strong it was. But I was walking around in Antigua, and I went into this little gift shop, and there was a picture of an Indian woman uh, tied to an altar, and it looked exactly um, the way the altar is described in um, Old Testament literature. And I asked the guy about it, and he just kind of hemmed and hawed because he didn't know that answer. It was a human sacrifice, of course, um, on an altar in the town. 
but I often wonder, I'm not sure when the um, the earth was split up, the continents, but I also wondered, uh, were these traditions brought by travelers? It's too similar to be a coincidence. Or were, were the land masses still growing and um, they were aware and observed the, um, the Jewish sacrifices and then they adapted it more? And, I think well, we know that they were they were spread throughout the land before God separated, correct? He dispersed them, and then it, uh, we read about Peleg and when the continents were divided. But I think that God put that into the very essence of man that there had to be an atonement, mm -hmm. and I think that was just part of what uh, God did. Because of what uh, 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 Adam did, there had there was that wanting to get back to and the atonement for what they were doing. So I kind of think it was planted in man by God from the very beginning. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Could it also be? that at the very beginning, God instructed Adam and Eve yes. and the rest of the, their descendants on what to do. Mm -hmm. And when they dispersed, they yep. took that custom with them and they carried it on. I think that's both of it, personally, because they were sacrificing when everything was still one landmass. And it wasn't until, like I said, until uh, the time of Peleg that the land masses separated because in Babylon, he separated all the peoples. And I think that that, that went with it. Yeah, but the first sacrifice was, was the father when he mm -hmm. sacrificed to make garments. That's for right. Adam and Eve. So he did the first one. Right. And then Adam and Eve continued it. Right. And that was put into them that this is mm -hmm. what something to look for. Maybe God told them this is what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. They'll keep doing this. Well, also stop and think about it for a second. He Adam named all the animals. Well, he was smart. And he had a connection with nature that I don't think we'll ever have. And to know that two of the animals that he that was in the garden, he took care of, he nurtured, etc. had to be killed because of their transgressions. I think that would leave a feeling of, when I do, when I sin, when I do something that God doesn't tell me to do, I have to do something to atone. But yes, I, I saw yours. Yes. Oh, um, I was just gonna agree that both reasoning, mm -hmm. I think is valid. I don't know if anybody's read C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, and um, he's a wonderful thinker. And um, he he said he was uh, he didn't understand why the notion of good and evil was worldwide. Yeah. Um, and he just he thought that, like you said, God has put that in us inherently that each we know right. the difference between the good and evil. Now, whether we choose to do the good that's right. or the evil, that's a different story. But there's this concept worldwide. It's, it's, it's mankind. Yes, sir. I was just going to share, and also the prophets. The prophets tell us about the, the sacrifices uh -huh. and, and how it's going to continue. Right. And we know that it's going to be reinstated. Right. Yes, ma'am. I think deep down in a human being and in God, killing an animal goes against their nature. Uh, it's something that you have to be taught that this is why you're doing it because it's like God told Adam and Eve that they had to sacrifice. Now they're sacri it's like us having to sacrifice our pet. Yes, it's horrible. It's not something that we go out in the field and say, let's see uh, you, your, well, mm -hmm. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sacrifice you. And it's a random thing. 
like it eventually became to Indians that they just killed for the sake of killing and sacrificing. But I think deep down in a, a God-given creature, it goes against it, having to kill an animal. The remorse that comes from that mm -hmm. uh, makes the atonement at that time, you know, makes makes the atonement for our wrongdoing a heavy burden to bear. To bear. It really does. Yes, sir. If there's a change in the priesthood, how can you justify we're going to go back to sacrifice? Don't ask me. <laughs> what was your question? If there's been a change in the to you, Maria. A change in the priesthood. If there's a change in the priesthood, as a, yeah, then why would we go back to sacrifices? I think there's another solution to Ezekiel's temple. Don't know anything about the back of what we're going to do or not do. Speak for yourself. <laughs> we know it's really interesting because there is so much imagery in the word that we take our understanding and our our concepts and what we already perceive as what should be and put it on the word. And I Personally, I think that so many things are going to be revealed that probably will just surprise us and we'll go, oh my gosh, and other things will roll our socks up and down with joy. And we just don't understand it. We just have to take the word for what it says. Yes, yes, sir, second. Oh, who had his hand up first? Yes. Yeah, uh, my, my thought is uh, two things. Or maybe three that, that were made in the image of God. Uh -huh. Okay, we know that. So that's worldwide. Uh, the other thing that goes into the mix is, uh, of course, the sin. Uh -huh. So somehow we're an amalg uh, some sort of amalgamation at this point right. of what was it originally intended. Yeah, we're, we're not what was intended. Absolutely not. We have that sin nature. And it doesn't matter what we do, we still have the sin nature. Yes, sir. I think it's in the uh, book of Jasper. But it describes a time when the animals could speak. Absolutely, they communicated. And probably that was prior to the fall. Mm -hmm. And after the fall, whether they chose to stop or they stopped or whatever, the feeling of betrayal. Um, but I do think that God's plan is to return to what he originally intended. And that yes. would include no sacrifices at all. But when that occurred, perhaps the new heavens, the new earth. Yes, we don't know. Yeah. You know, the, I th find it absolutely fascinating that there was such a bond with Adam and creation that he could talk to the animals. And they talked back. And to think that that was now severed was horrific. But if we don't, and if you don't believe that, if you have a pet and you're sad, what does that pet do? If you're sick, what does that pet do? They have trained animals to notice an upcoming seizure. And we can't do that. Or smell out cancer. Or now they have even done it to when they notice anxiety. If they can feel and I don't know if it's hormones that's created. I don't know. They know when, an, when a person is going to have an anxiety or PTSD uh, episode. And the animals will actually back them into a corner to protect them. So there's a bond there that was so much stronger than what we have now. And I pray that we can go back. Well, I think <laughs> also that just because animals can't speak or can't talk doesn't mean they can't speak. They communicate with us. On a different plane. On a you, different plane. You know how to list. Absolutely. 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 But you know, nevertheless, okay, can we, without the Mishkan, which is, of course, the tabernacle or a temple, the laws of sacrifice seem largely absolutely irrelevant. Nevertheless, the study of sacrifices from a messianic perspective reconciles apparent discrepancies between the scriptures and it corrects some common theological errors. 
It illuminates the content of the by, uh, book of Hebrews, and it brings glory to our master who laid down his life as a sacrifice for us. Now, the, the, my parasha is Vayikra. Now, everybody knows, I hope, that Vayikra starts with a vav. Pick your heads. Okay. And vav is the conjunction. And the verse is, Moshe was not able to enter the temple, the tent of meeting, because the Lord had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Then the Lord called to Moshe. Well, in Hebrew, it starts with, and Adonai called to Moshe. So we do something very, very silly. You know, uh, we as, especially as Americans, we make it sound the way we want it to make it sound. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really awkward. And it doesn't give validity to the way that they divided up the books. You don't start a book with and he, right? There's no background, right? It's kind of like, huh? Well, we have to remember that that means that by Vaikra continues the exodus narrative. And that's what B is. Vaikra continues the exodus narrative without a disjunction, a disjunction or a disconnection. As if the beginning of Vaikra actually is part of the story. It's a sentence that connects the two stories. Yeah, I often wonder what made them divide the books the way they did, or even the chapters. Sometimes it's like, you know, you really made understanding this very difficult. Very, yeah, and it's like pick and choose, pick and choose, throw a dart, whatever they wanted to do, right? Yes. I kind of feel like there weren't, there was no like time space because wasn't it the Maccabean war, like the Maccabean uh, war going on during that time? During Vaikra? No, not during Vaikra, but when you said between the two. Oh, oh. Well, you know, I think that made that when it was put into the Septuagint, it may have been different than when it was translated into the other languages. Um, and because there is no direct translation from one language to another. I can't directly translate because of the way the, the uh, grammatical structure of a sentence is, it makes no sense. So people have to change it around so it makes sense in your language. And as you know, if we've studied Hebrew, that the way that Hebrew is formed, it's a specific context. You have a verb and it's followed by something else. It's not everything's all mixed up. Mm -hmm. So I think that they had to do that. They did that, but I don't think they did it in, in a really proper manner. Look at Romans 12. And I'm just answering your questions. Romans 12 and verses one and two, right? What does Romans 12, two say? Transform. Right. Transform your mind, right? But it starts with therefore. Chapter 12 starts with therefore. Therefore, you know, take all thoughts captive, right? Therefore, well, what's the therefore, therefore? <laughs> why did they why did they stop the chapter there? Yeah. Because the therefore is in Romans 11 that tells you because all these things God has done for you. Therefore, take your take your mind captive. So, you know, um, it's an arbitrary thing. It really is. So Vaikra fell into right into that. And, right? And, and, <clears throat> yes. We also saw that in the, in the commandments. Mm -hmm. When, when uh, the Lord gave the Ten Commandments, then, uh, after the Lord gave the Ten Commandments, then that parasha ended. Yeah, but. The next parasha started, but it's a continuation. Yes. It, it's right there. So a lot of people who might think that, Oh, he only gave us 10 commandments. That's right. No, he did not. You know, there are many more. Right, right. Well, and another good example is uh, Dabarim, <clears throat> what, 27 and 20, 26, 27, and 8, stand alone. And people say, well, you know, God's going to bless me. Well, 
I love the one. Bless coming, bless going. And Christians, I'm getting off on a rabbi trail. Christians claim that. I am blessed coming, I'm blessed going, I am blessed in the city, I'm blessed out of the city, blah, blah, blah. And they take that and they say, well, that's all. But then 26, 27, and 28 says, but if you don't, there's blessings and there's cursings. So, you know, we, we arbitrarily take what we want out of the word, which is terrible. Well, and they don't look at the, the, the part before. The yeah. Blessings, what you need to do. That's right. To those blessings, right? Right, right. Or they don't read the verse after. Because it, it actually starts with another conjunction, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, and we don't want to leave, read that. Yeah. So it's almost like, okay, I'm going to take that out, and I'm going to take that out, and I'm just going to do what I want together. Okay. Context, context. Context rules, I'll tell you. Context, context, context. Okay, so let me get back here before I run too far amok. You know, in the last chapter of Shemot, Moshe and Israel encountered a problem with the Mishkan or the tabernacle. It seemed that the tabernacle was a success. The presence of God had taken up residence within it, and it served its function as a dwelling place of the divine presence. However, a flaw with a concept immediately surfaced. Even if God could dwell among the Israelites in a holy place, this did not mean that the Israelites could dwell or have any communion or interaction with him. They were a sinful people, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. God was still Kodesh. Kadosh, I'm sorry. Man was still unholy. How could the holy man, an unholy man, come near to the holy God? God was still, still transcendent and divine, and man was not. God had taken up residence in the Mishkan, but he was unapproachable. Even Moshe was not able to enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of God had filled the Mishkan. And though we desire communion and fellowship with God, every natural inclination of our hearts resist him. That sinful nature. You know, it's like the little boy that's standing in the corner. I'm sitting down on the inside, but I'm standing up on the outside. We do that, don't we? That's our sinful nature. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. He is imp he is get back where I am. He is life. We are mortal. He is pure. We are polluted. He is infinite and we're finite. He is holy and we are common. He is transcendent. We are earthen. Man cannot on his own enter in to God's presence. So we end, the end of Shemot leaves us with this cliffhanger. The Mishkan's here. The divine's presence are here. But guess what? You can't come near. And then we had, and Adonai spoke to Moshe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. God's going to get us over the cliffhanger. So how are we to do that? How are we to come near to him? If Moshe stood in the presence of Mount Sinai, right, and he couldn't enter, how much less could an ordinary man enter the Mishkan? That sets the stage. That's the and. That's the vav. Now, the next text of Vayikra begins with God calling to Moshe from within the tent of meeting. Prior to this, God had always spoken to Moshe from the top of Mount Sinai and face to face. But now that he's within the Mishkan, he had to call. See the difference? He had to invite him. He had to call him into his presence. The Hebrew name of the book of Leviticus. Do you not have to say the Hebrew for a while? Does the other kind of get stuck on your tongue? I, I use logos. I love logos. Mm -hmm. But you know, it does not really know. It doesn't know the true names of the book. Oh, yeah. It doesn't know it. You pay big bucks for locus, lo logos, locus, logos, and it doesn't know what Vayikra is. Well, and I pull it up. I can have it, and I've got everything for it. But when I do searches, it won't search for the correct name. Silly, isn't it? Yes, sir. Do you have the um, 
messianic um, edition, uh, shall I say, because and in logos they have different uh you can study from a different yep. uh denomination right groups or... right but it still searches it still searches by its name now because i i put it together and it's like so i'm typing Aikra. well that didn't work no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's really kind of frustrating anyway Programmer. yeah say hey right well there's no workaround I'm a computer, I'm an analyst. There's no workaround for that. Boom. Okay. So two, Moshe was unable to enter the sanctuary. So God called to him from within to explain how he could be approached. And he did that through the Korban. Now, I have to, Felicia, kudos. Kudos. As I was walking around, she said, Carol, does that say Corban? And I said, yes. Oh, I was just trying to figure that out. <laughs> That's a pay, raish. Uh, no, no, this is a kuf. Oh, a kuf? A raish. Oh, oh, I got Bet. That. And a non, non sofit. Oh, it's a korban. Oh, okay. Alicia takes after her mom. Yes. <laughs> yes. Actually, it's really funny because in class, Felicia is madly doing this. So everything that I've written down, she has, she makes sure she, and she gets so excited when she gets it. <laughs> so the Korban is in Vaikra 1, 1 through 2. Then the Lord called to Moshe and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. The word offering is translated, of course, the word korban. And it's a sacrifice. Neither one of those English words really accurately express the concept, though, of the korban. The word sacrifice implies that the person bringing it must deprive himself of something that he cherishes. The word offering implies a payment, a fee, or a bribe, a tribute, or a gratuity. But God has no satisfaction in inflicting deprivation upon his children. And he's not in need of a tribute or a gift. Now, I asked our scholar, Maria, <laughs> to do a, little do a little gematria study on that. And she's going to just give it in one sentence. What does Kurban mean? <laughs> Got to use the microphone. The birthing of a man, Yeshua, in the house of the royal priest. That's a korban. We have the insight from the very beginning of what a korban was to be. If you studied discovering Yeshua in the tabernacle with us, it's all about God's plan from the very beginning, wasn't it? Yes. Did, did you read that or say that? Yeah. The birthing of the man, which is Yeshua, in the house of the royal priest. You know, anybody who thinks that the Jewish language um, isn't given by God needs to do some more studying. Mm -hmm. Right? A, the word offering translates the Hebrew word korban. Okay? Now, the korban implies more than merely a sacrifice or an offering. The root of the word korban is karav. And the Hebrew, every Hebrew word has a three letter root. And if you know the root, you can understand basically about what the word is going to be about, correct? And a Hebrew verbal root can be translated as to come near. A korban can be defined more accurately as something brought near. And that's your next fill in. The person bringing a korban does so in order to come closer to God. The word speaks for itself, both in the paleo and in the gematria. It doesn't that just roll your socks up and down? I'm not getting any comments. Uh oh. <laughs> 
Doesn't that just roll your socks up and down? I mean, it should give you goosebumps to think that God planned the Korban in order to bring us near to him. Yes, sir. That, that goes back to the point of what was the Korban all about? What was the purpose? That's right. And there was never salvation mm -hmm. of animals. You know that from nope. the book of Hebrews. Um, it was to be brought near. I always, when I teach, I teach that it's like this, the heat shields on the, on the uh, shuttle craft. Mm -hmm. it, 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 well, it's what prevents yep. the shuttle from being burned up in the presence right. of gravity. It was the same thing with the sacrifice. That's right. And then to the, the point that Bill made about the new priesthood uh, under Melchizedek, uh, I think sometimes we oversimplify that. Because think about this. Moshe said, God is going to raise up a prophet yes. like me. That's right. Now, he was not, he was, although he was from the tribe of Levi, he was not a Levitical priest. Mm -mm. And yet, he could go into the presence of God anytime. So, what we have is, is we have, we know that the Levitical priesthood is going to last forever. At least through the millennial reign. Right. Because the, the ancestors of Zadok will always be present before the Lord is what it says. So here we have a, and, and then of course we have the Melchizedek priesthood under Yeshua running parallel and at the mm -hmm. same time. Just like Moshe and Aaron were running parallel. Um, and Yeshua, of course, when he comes back, is coming back as the king, right. not That's the right. priest. He's acting as the priest now. Right. Uh, and so in the millennial reign, we're going to have to have uh, that heat shield back again. Mm -hmm. There are mortals in the millennial reign that have to that want to draw near to God. Plus the fact if we do away with, plus five of the prophets tell us right. they're going to be sacrificing right. through the millennial reign. And mm -hmm. if we're not sacrificing, then all of the Moedim also have to change. That's right. Because the Moedim require sacrifice. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. For those that are not covered by the blood of Yeshua, in, in this case, they, they have to have a covering of some sort just to get near to God. And Ezekiel, of course, tells us that that area of sanctuary around Jerusalem is three miles wide, eight miles long. Without the covering, you can't even enter that district. And yet, we see people that are going up to the temple. They're actually commanded. It's commanded for them to come up to the temple. And then when they leave, they see the dead bodies of those that were not uh, mm -hmm. following the, the correct procedures. So, so I think we oversimplify sometimes the whole idea of what Hebrew says is there, if there's a change in the priesthood, it necessitates a change in the law. Uh, I think we oversimplify that because I think Personally, my study reveals, I think both, both priesthoods are going to run parallel to one another. Now, how is that going to look? How is it going to operate? I don't think we know that. But the word is pretty clear yeah. on that. And so the people that want to come up and, and meet the Lord that, that, aren't, uh, that are still mortal, do they not need a covering still? And, and Yeshua is acting as king then. <coughs> If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we see a parallel. If you go back to, to Moshe and Aaron and the priesthood yes. there, it, it really, it's not a simple no. uh, yeah. issue at all. It's a very complex issue. Uh, so, And if you look at Melchizedek, one of the things about it is, is he was not a priest after the, the lineage, correct? Right. Right. But he had, no he had no lineage. But we do know that he represented Avram to God, right. and he represented God to Avram, yeah. which is a very visual of what Yeshua does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it kind of, I mean, all this kind of belittles what Yeshua did. Oh, no. We're going to get into that. Please don't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Oh. It, it lays it, it lays the groundwork. So the people in the millennium cannot believe in Yeshua as Messiah. Mm. 
I don't believe that. I believe that there so, will be, I will believe that there will be com people converted. Yeah. Yeah, there I'm will be people that, saved. I'm just saying more to enter the millennial reign is our understanding. Mm -hmm. And and they're not saved. Not everyone on earth. Right. Yeah, there'll be people here that are not, not saved. Not everybody on earth is going to be killed during the tribulation. So you and I are going to have our immortal bodies. This is our understanding of it. And those that survive that, that tribulation are going to go into the millennial reign as in their mortal body. And a mortal body, this is just what we're talking about, most day couldn't get into the presence of God. So a mortal body cannot come into the presence of God in its fullness. And this is why Yeshua, although he was the fullness of the Godhead, he did not possess the whole mm -hmm. power of the Godhead while he was here, where you couldn't even look right. on him and live. Right. That becomes problematic. He touched people. They ran up to him, touched the cloak, and they lived to talk about it. Does that make sense? So there's going to be conversions in the in the millennial reign. Because that, that goes for a thousand years, we're going to be giving birth. Mm -hmm. Marriage, marriage, dying. So those yeah. people have got to, yeah. You're going to live to be about a hundred. They say the word says if right. you live, if you don't live to a hundred, you that your people died say, young. Died young. Mm -hmm. So everything in the millennial reign is pretty much the same as it is here, except we have a king in Jerusalem. But the whole world is not subservient to that king. How do we know that? There's disobedience. Yeah. So that all of this stuff is very problematic. So I think we oversimplify it by saying, well, there's a new priesthood now. There's a new priest in town. Yeah. But and there is a priest, there is a new priesthood introduced, no doubt. Melchizedek priesthood. But we're not told a whole lot about that. But we but we we actually know more about the Levitical priesthood in the millennial reign than we do the, than the than the mm -hmm. Melchizedek priesthood. We know Zadok's going to have his ancestors in the priesthood for that entire time. And we know that there is sacrificing going on. And I'm assuming the Melchizedek priest is not going to partake in the sacrifice, but that's my own assumption. So I think the Levitical priesthood is going to be overseeing that, which becomes kind of an interesting concept. We really don't know much about it. And what we do have is limited to our understanding. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just chafing at the bit, but I'm just going to throw a hand grenade in the okay. form of a question. And then I have a, a, an, another question to ask you. Um, Herod's temple was not prophesied. Ezekiel was written 1,500 years before Herod's temple. If Ezekiel's temple is actually Herod's temple, Going against J. Vernon McGee and Pastor Bruce and thousands of people. We got a whole different story. And um, I'm going to leave that as a question. Some of what you're talking about, though, the most baffling verse in scripture for me is when Yeshua is on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter's trying to have a conversation with God, keeping in mind that no man has ever seen God, so we have to be careful of all these interactions. And God totally ignored him. Totally, like he's just, you know, um, grass on the mountain. And um, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if Yeshua was in a different dimension, which Peter got a glimpse of. And some of what you're talking about here, you know, might might help bring that more in focus. Um, God was not actually in a dimension that Peter could see or touch. I don't think God. Yeah, I don't think God is in a dimension. That we can see and, and touch. God lives outside of time and he lives outside of space. Right. I think Yeshua bridged that during his transfiguration. That's my opinion. We got a kind of a shadow of what it is. Mm -hmm. Peter, there was no discussion between right. Peter and God. Right. Okay, move on. Those are loving rabbi trails, right? <laughs> now, we have to remember that most times, we believe 
Christians believe, the majority of Christians believe, we're taught that Israel brought sacrifices to pay for the penalty of their sins, correct? By this reasoning, the sacrifices function as a sort of scapegoat. And Pastor Bruce addressed that. When a man merited the divine death, death penalty at the hands of heaven, he could make a sacrifice instead. He slaughtered the unfortunate cow, sheep, or goat, or dove, or whatever in his place. Again, an oversimplification of this concept has it that God was angry with the sinner and demanded punishment, even the sinner's death. Now, after all, the wages of sin is death, correct? The sinner then killed an animal and the death of the animal appeased God. God is no longer feeling angry after the animal was sacrificed. At least something had been killed. The blood of the animal appeased an angry God. Well, this is, is this really what the Torah teaches? No. Is this really what the apostles taught? No. Sacrificial substitution of propitiation was far more complex and mystical. Furthermore, most of the sacrifices were not offered for sin at all. And that's your fill-in. <laughs> B is the sacrifice is something that can we can bring near to God. One, most of the sacrifices were not offered for sin at all. Torah does require sin offerings and guilt offerings and consequences of certain sins, but most of the sacrifices described in the Bible are not like that, and their korban is not like that. In most cases, it's a glad and willing worshiper offering his sacrifices voluntarily, not as a ransom for his own life. We often think that in the Tanakh or the Old Testament times, people had to bring sacrifices again to pay for their sins, but they weren't for paying for sins. In the Torah, a death of an animal does not substitute for the death of the sinner. What good would that do? Right? Instead, the death of the animal provides a proxy to bring the worshiper near to God. It does not appease an angry God. It provides a method by which God might be approached. Very similar to what you were talking about, the coverings on the shuttlecraft, right? Yeah. Nevertheless, animal sacrifices do illustrate the concept of vicarious offering. Vicarious offerings means that someone else suffers on your behalf and provides atonement for you so that you do not need to suffer. And that's your fill-in. Someone else suffers on your behalf and provides atonement so that you do not need to suffer. And again, I stated, you know, got it? Do I need to say it again? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think for me, I think three of the hardest concepts to understand in the Word of God is the calendar. Mm -hmm. The calendar is an incredibly mm -hmm. complex study. The red heifer, yeah. no one has a clue what that's about. <laughs> and the sacrifices. Yeah. These are these are concepts that quite uh, quite honestly I think are above our pay grade. That's right. Yeah. And and we have to just wrestle th through them to the best of our ability because I don't believe all of us together have the, the brain mm -hmm. uh input and power to to dice to, to, uh, decipher what it all means. It is incredibly complex. Well you know and if we do if we did know it all, where's our trust? Where's our faith? Wow. Yeah, it's like, oh gosh, well, we know, we know everything about it, you know, nanny, nanny, boo, boo type thing. And there would have to be no faith in how God is going to work things out. That's just, again, my opinion. And again, I want to say, despite, despite all of what we have conceptually understood about sacrifices, they are not primarily for a paying for one's sin. And you can get into such a dialogue with a, a, a mainstream Christian about that, that you could go on for years, right? Well, the, but there are five different types of sacrifices and I put them on the back 
of your sheet of paper, because we're going to be stuck in Vayikra 1, 1 through 5. We're not going to go any farther than that, because that is enough to chew on, right? And so in Vayikra 1, 3, we read, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice, or excuse me, a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it, a male without defect, he shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. Do you see it? It says, not say a tone. It doesn't say, put back in right stead. It doesn't. It says that he might be accepted. He may be brought near. The priestly laws of Iepra introduced the five sacrifices, beginning with the most fundamental and basic of all, the burnt offering. By studying the laws that pertain to a burnt offering, we'll learn principles that apply to all types of Levitical sacrifices. Now, the English name burnt offering does not accurately, by any means, shape, or form, cover what the Corbano law is. You know, we try to put English meaning on words, and it doesn't work. The word Allah means that which arises. So the Korban Allah could be called a sacrifice that arises. It arises before God. The worshiper who brought the animal as an Allah offering completely surrendered it to God. He didn't get anything back from it at all. Now, the ancient Israelites had nothing to gain by offering a burnt offering. He didn't bring it to recompense for his sins or his guilt. And unlike the other type of offerings or sacrifices that worship mark, worshiper might bring to the Lord, the burnt offering did not profit the worshiper in any way. He retained no choice portions of meat. Yes, sir. Yeah, the burnt offering can be prepared in today's uh, understanding of our, our worship and That's our right. pray, because that is going up. That's the Ola. Uh -huh. And the, the lips is the same word as bowl. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it's the it's the worship of our right. lips going up to God. It's the equivalent, in my mm -hmm. opinion, of the burnt offering. Yep. Uh, and we get nothing bowl. back from it. No, you, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. You can sit in a worship service and do nothing. Yeah. You do get nothing back. Well, you, well, you draw near to God. You draw nearer to God. But that's that's the Korban Allah. Yeah. Is the worship brings you into his presence. That's how we draw near to God. And those that just sit, they don't draw near. Well, and just like Maria read, it's that Korban Allah that brings us through the worship experience into his presence. We draw near. And we have an option. We have a choice. We can sit like bumps on a log and sit there, twiddle our thumbs and sit on our bum and not experience the drawing near at all. What was the word for dip and bowl? So more than any other korban that might be presented to the Lord, the Allah symbolizes a complete surrender to God. What was the? Oh, I'm sorry. It called a sacrifice that rises. A sacrifice that rises. It stands in the stead of its owner as a token of complete selfless devotion of one's entire essence, a reckless abandonment to God. Isn't that what we do when we worship? That's that's our goal in worship, isn't it? Is that total abandonment to God. In this respect, the burnt offering symbolized the total zariq or the righteous person, he completely surrenders his will and his essence to God as a living sacrifice. We lose ourselves. We lose ourselves. I love it. Uh, the song that we sang, you know, use me, fill me, you know, you do it through me, not necessarily me, because everything is about you. Such is the master who's the living Korban Allah. Of the eternal altar. If you could give a basic step by step recipe of how to worship God to draw near to Him, how would you put that? I think it's different for each person. That's my personal opinion. 
And, but it's that losing yourself in him. And I can be a Korban Olah sitting in there, losing myself in worship. I can be a Korban Olah sitting on my patio, looking at the amazing things that God has given me, which I, my soul needs. It needs my birds. It needs my waterfall. It needs the sun. That's what my soul needs. And I can sit there and be a Korban Olah, Olah as I say, Lord, you are so good. You have given me everything my soul needs. I think it's different for each person. It can be different in, in circumstances. When my son was diagnosed, me saying, Lord, you love him more than I could possibly love him. And I give him to you. That was my korban Allah. I released him. More practical, less conceptual. I don't know. Each person is going to have to do that for themselves. And that's my opinion. Other than participating and putting yourself into the worship, allowing yourself to be open enough and saying, Lord, fill me so that I can return back to you. I don't know what it would be. Pastor Bruce. Yeah, I, I think we all know like about the five love languages. You have love, you have uh -huh. a love language. And that is the language that communicates love right. to you. Okay. Um I think that the Lord has placed within different congregations and different, uh, even different faiths. Uh, for instance, the Jews, I think, draw near and express that devotion and that that uh, korban to God through the liturgy. And then for some of us, liturgy is just a waste of time. It doesn't mean much to us. It's not our love language. Our love language, uh, well, for like Kathleen and I, my favorite part of the worship is singing in the spirit. Yeah. I mean, that's where I lose myself. Is right in the in the the singing the choruses is fine, and and I do draw close to the Lord there. But when I sing in the spirit, I get caught up to the Lord. Uh, but a lot of people don't like singing in the spirit. They like the choruses. The Baptists want to sing the hymns. So I think a lot of everyone kind of approaches God on a different thing. And, he, and I think even denominations, mm -hmm. if you think about denominations, one of the biggest factors in denominations is not the doctrine. It's the form of worship. Our, our, our doctrinal statement comes from Rick Warren, Baptist. We believe the same thing the Baptists believe in the, in the, in the important issues. You know, he was crucified, rose on the third day. That's Baptist. Does that make sense? So the expression of worship is what differentiates us more than anything, I think. Well, you know, and he's given each one of us. Yeah, he's a personal savior. He's a personal God. And the way I enter into his presence is maybe different than the way you enter into his presence or the way you enter into his presence. Because if he were, if we were cookie cutters, there wouldn't have to be a personal relationship. And remember we talked this weekend about the woman who was the sinner who came to meet mm -hmm. Yeshua face to face and her worship was the she wept on his mm -hmm. dirty feet. Oh. She wiped them with her hair and then she kissed his feet and then she broke that alabaster box and she gave everything she had to him. So to me, it's a full surrender, mm -hmm. but it will be it's different it. for every one of us. Right? Absolutely. It's that living sacrifice. It says, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I am nothing without you. You're my whole being. Just a second. Yes, I think I forgot what he originally asked, but I feel like my, mm -hmm. yeah. I th okay, okay, so I think what I, I forgot, like what he originally asked, asked, but this is my answer. That's why I see that. Um, for me to like fully surrender and to just like, it was maybe like, maybe last year sometime, it was the first time that I was home alone at my son's house and um, I was in his living room and I never did this before because I, I would watch, you know, the members here get on their face up here in the front and I was like, <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that next in my part, but I did, that's what I did. So I did that in my living room, my son's living room. I got on the floor, I prayed and I, I stretched out my body. At first it seemed weird, but then after it kind of released something, it made me feel 
in my different and then um I, in there and I would just open my son's curtains and it's he has really nice big windows in the front so the sunlight would come through and I could almost like look through and like pray and then I started noticing that when we when we prayed here that we faced this way <laughs> towards Jeez. Yeah. Jerusalem. So that's when I really started like doing what I think I am trying to answer that. Like I would face like east and in my son's house, and then that's where I started praying. And then myself, it was just like coming in into me, into my heart. And I would um I started raising my hands up, things I wouldn't do. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that in church before or even in a in a meeting. I would never do that because it seemed stupid to me. But the more I started doing it while I was alone. That's where I felt more like free to, to it's almost seeing out loud because I never used to. Now sometimes I feel like I'm too loud, but um, that's, that's we, kind of you know it's really interesting because I think God takes each one of us and looks at our our the roadblocks, the roadblocks to giving absolutely everything up to Him, and He has to take those down some way. And each person's a little bit different. You know, because he says, oh, I know that you've got, I'm just speaking about me, you've got to be in control. You've got to make sure your surroundings are safe. You've got to make sure that nothing comes up on you that unexpectedly. You can't do that. So to me, it was speaking in tongues. It was like, oh, no, I don't have control over this. And I have no idea what I'm doing. And I have no idea what I'm saying. But it's once you surrender that, that barricade that brings you into the presence. Yes, sir, again, we need I, to kind of- I still sense there may be a, a lot of people that need the more concrete, specific, exactly. boom, 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 boom. I don't think, well, personally, I don't think that there is a boom, 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 boom. I don't think there's a cookie cutter stamp. I don't think there's a formula. I think God works, praise his name. He works with each one of us individually, but it's that giving up control. Yeah. It's that saying, Lord, everything I am is yours and I trust you with it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> You're a right sided brain person. I I'm not sure, but I feel like maybe he's wanting more, you know, like examples yeah. of like maybe not, you know, what he should be doing, but examples of what. He could be doing, you know, like dancing or singing. Well, we just talked about that. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Uh, music, singing, releasing yourself, laying, you know, giving up and surrendering, saying, God, you're calling me to do this, and I'm not comfortable doing yeah. this by doing this. Me saying, I'm giving you my son. It's me saying, Lord, uh, I've got to have this little control bubble because then I'm safe, but you want me to speak in tongues. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, that, it's that giving up of the stronghold and saying, Lord, You've got me. You love me. You've got me. You're caring for me. And you want a closer relationship with me and I with you. So whatever it takes. Yes, ma'am. Well, whoever was first. Okay. We're, we are in such a conversation that's going so many ways. You need to kind of rein it in. Okay, um, whoever has a mic, just speak. I'm just talking now. <laughs> I can't see you. Am I oh. still not loud? No, I can't see you. I'm sorry. I heard this voice coming from somewhere. Yes, okay. ma'am. Um, oh, wow. Well, I won't do this, but Psalm 95 spells out some of the form. Okay. Oh, well, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully and on. I won't read it all. But to me, it's I can be laying in bed. Mm -hmm. Say, okay. All right, Lord, what are we going to do here? You know, and I'm thinking about things. And then I can go right into tongues and I can go into worship, deep worship. I can be sitting at my desk and all of a sudden I start to cry. Okay, Lord, you know, and then I start thinking about people that need prayer. Yeah, well, honestly, I get yeah. out the directory and I go through the directory at times. But I think, like you said, we're all individuals. That's right. And God will just bring it on to you. There's no set nope. formula, but if you want to start with the formula, go to Psalms 95. Right. Well, you know, um, we shared a moment of intimate worship at Sukkot. We were standing in the showers, opposite that showers. Me, that was music. Yeah, you that were playing the music, but we were standing in opposite shower stalls, right? <laughs> and this music came on. 
And pretty soon I heard a little voice. And we're standing in the shower singing. I come to the garden alone. And we both came out in tears. You can experience that intimately with sleep God anywhere. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. <laughs> and pray God for separate. separate. We don't have to take showers. Um, I don't know how many were there yesterday during worship, but um, it was uniquely um, special yesterday. Yes. Um, and as I was being one, I think, with the Lord and dancing, um, I the Spirit just said, take a look around. And I saw, I'm not going to say names, but I saw some people singing with their absolute abandon. And then I saw people on their knees and I saw people on their face. And um, yep. it was powerful. Yes, it was extremely powerful, extremely powerful. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait a minute. No, I, well, I have Debbie. Or Joan, Janie. The things that uh, I was listening to today was what Gary was saying about a more concrete kind of example or examples. And I was also listening to what Taryn had to say. And um, I was making a list partially from what they were saying and partially from what my own experience has been. I would like to say only, first of all, that there is no one way to worship because I have had people show me thanksgiving or gratitude or respect or love or caring in different ways yes. from what anyone else will show me that. And so I believe that that is the same kind of model mm -hmm. that we should look at when we are truly worshiping God. I made a list of ways that I combine sometimes daily, sometimes, you know, every other day, sometimes just during the week. And that is prayer, uh, worship, reading, meditation of the word, dancing, playing instruments and singing, tongues and rest and waiting on the Lord, and even a time that I make a first thing in the morning, waiting on the Lord, but making it a routine mm -hmm. before I do anything else, which are all important things to me. I try to meet with the Lord, and that could be just waiting in silence for him to speak to my heart and give me direction for the day or right. give me uh, information that I've been searching for. It could be just uh, reading a, a scripture or two or maybe a chapter or two in the morning. It could mean in asking the Lord to put my mind, my heart, and my spirit into a place where I am receiving from him. Great. I just want to say that while it's true that there is no formula, it is profoundly powerful to hear examples. And especially in the format of Every person saying their own. It's, That's right. it's like a testimony. Well, it's it is part a, of your it, testimony. It's a testimony, and it gives other people who who are struggling some more concept. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, to uh, I think to answer with one thing, the most important dynamic we have, I believe, is tongues. And and the reason I say that is because tongues edifies the, the speaker. Mm -hmm. Now, what does edification mean? Does it just mean you feel good? Now, I don't think God's that interested in you mm -hmm. feeling that good. I don't think that's his purpose at all. I think tongues edifies you because it draws you to the Father faster than anything because it's the Spirit speaking through you. It's the inner mm -hmm. man. It's deep calling unto deep is what it is. And when we, we speak or we sing in the spirit, we are instantly drawn into the to the throne room, if you will, into the presence of God. I think it's a single, uh, and this is, I, I believe, why Paul said, I wish you all spoke in tongues. That's right. Why would, he, why would he say, I wish you all spoke in language that nobody understands? Why would he say that? Because it draws you to God. It's the parim ola. It's the ascending of your lips and completely spirit led because you are out of the picture, right. except you become the recipient of the benefits of it. 
So I encourage people, uh, and, and this is why the enemy fights tongues so hard. I mean, he doesn't fight prophecy that hard or healing. He fights tongues. And it's because tongues edify the you. It's what draws you near to the Father faster and more completely than any other thing. Although we've had a great list and they're all valid. I think tongues is number one. And yes, one, sir. And one thing that I think that's concrete is disruption. Don't let disruption get in the way. No. Friday night, no. just as wonderful as it was mm -hmm. Shabbat morning, Shabbat <laughs> evening, yeah. we had a disruption yes. there. But I'll tell you something. Once the disruption was removed, boy, did we enter yeah. in. And we had a very good worship. If if Hasatan can disrupt our worship, which prepares us to hear the word, then he's accomplished a lot. And we can't let him accomplish anything. Yes, ma'am. And then we need to kind of move on. Okay. Um, just to kind of go over my homework from, from Yeshiva, I did. And um, I, the one word that kind of sums up everything that we're talking about right now, can I read the definition of it? Sure. Or just a couple. Of yeah, as long as it's short. Okay. The word excel. <laughs> okay. The word excel is translated from like I looked it up in the um, Strong's first first in strength first born the beginning speech love knowledge a command and I have these in Bible verses as well it's a root glitter from afar temple to be eminent music overseer law senses Restore, shoot forth a set scale and nourish. And then what Pastor Bruce just said, the word, mm -hmm. well, the speech, back to the speech, mm -hmm. the word is our wisdom that we get through the Holy through the Holy Spirit. And that is that speaking to us. So it goes back to the, the first mm -hmm. definition I got right. right after speech. You know, it's really, um, if you hadn't considered it, our study on God's gifts in you and through you is helping us identify that the gifts were given to us and how much God loves us. And it's only through accepting those gifts that he has given us and treasuring them can we then give them out from the overflow. Yes, one more time. <laughs> the, the thing about tongue. And I hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree. But I think, okay, why does a lot more people not do that? And I'm, I try to think, okay, well, why is that? I mean, a double. Well, I can tell you, too, it's a prayer. It's fear. No, it's, I, I think it's good to analyze or, or problem solve why people are hesitant or why they don't do that, what holds them back. Well, yeah, pers let, pers let, 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 well, we need to feel like with prayer. Well, I can understand prayer. I can do prayer. I can do that. Singing, I can sing. I can do it. You know, tongues is kind of like, you know, and it has a history of, you know, the, 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 Ooh, the, the you know, it, it, it has <laughs> a lot of people just like, don't understand it. And there's there's a sense of losing the mm -hmm. control. That's it. There's there's a sense That's there's it. a sense of doubt in the sense of mm -hmm. am I just babbling gibberish? You know, am I an idiot? Am I a, a lot of these things that a lot of people are afraid to admit or to say? They'll they come, they'll listen, you know, but they won't voice the the the, the things that they their fears and their doubts. You, you're a teacher. A lot of times in class, lots of students simply don't ask questions because they don't want to stupid. Well, now that, that I'm going to have to say that's not true because I say almost every single class, there is no stupid I know, question. I know that. And if they don't have, you know, we're not going to get into that. Um, we need to move on. And I think that we'll never solve that in this session. I think that this needs to be a whole different session to talk about. Um, tongues is because it's woo-woo, 
They say that they've lost control. They say that it's not a gift from God. It's got to be a gift from Hasatan. They say that it's no longer present in this present age. Um, and I don't think that you can answer those questions to such an extent that people will change their mind. And that's my personal opinion. It's got to be the Holy Spirit convicting them and drawing them near and saying, I want this, Lord. I need this. And maybe that's a better word, need. When we get to the point that we need total abandonment and a connection with God, then we release our own self-control and give it to God. Okay, I mean, I, that's all I can say about that. Yes, sir. And then we need to, because we can discuss tongues till the cows fly home. Yeah, real quick, real quickly. I mean, you believing in God, most people think that's ridiculous. Okay, so let's get over that. I mean, if you decide to go mm -hmm. on this track, then you got under, you want to fully invest. That's right. And desire everything that God has for you. Otherwise, you're wasting time. Uh, so uh, anyway, so that's uh, you know there are excesses yep. in everything. Right. I believe Satan will do yes. and, and and mimic everything to confuse us. Yes. And that's just going to get worse over the whenever the the end. Of oh well, and we see it coming now, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. One well, one quick and, and, and sure. I have a question here to the average Old Testament Israeli. What how was, was he, did he have access to this um, way of uh, investing or dealing with God? You mean tongues? Well, no, not tongues, sorry. I, I switched gears. Like, uh, Coming into the his presence? Did the average person, uh, was he able to um, uh, gain this type of access to We're good. God? You know, that's a great question because it leads us right back into the study. <laughs> da -da, da -da, right more than any other so it's a midrash absolutely if you don't this is a great example right more than any other korban that might be presented to the lord the Allah symbolizes a complete surrender of god it stands in the stead of its owner as a token of complete selfless devotion of one's entire essence a reckless abandonment to God. I repeat that it again. So you have that for it. No, ordinarily, but not always, a man brought a burnt offering voluntarily. He brought it because he desired to draw near to God. Now, Jewish tradition states that the heart, the burnt offering can only be brought with great joy. Absolutely great joy. And in Tehillim 27, 6, we read, that David exclaimed, I will offer in his tents sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. It's that drawing near, it's that complete release. But, you know, we are sinful. And we cannot draw near to God without a protective shield. Right. Mm -hmm. And we see that through the laying on of hands in the law. It says in verse four, he shall lay his hands of the burnt on the burnt offering. It may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. The worshiper regarded the sacrifice as a substitute for himself. And that's your filling. In that respect, respect, the sacrifice was a ritual surrogate for the offerer. The first ritual procedure required the laying on of hands or the sepha. The act of sepha applied a physical leaning on the animal. They didn't just like the animal. They leaned into it. They pressed into it. That's something you need too, isn't it? They pressed in to the animal. It actually, their whole weight and it was transferred to the animal. That symbolized that both the ownership of the animal and an investment of the identity of the offerer was now placed on that animal. This is my animal, therefore it represents me at the altar. This same terminology appears in Bid Midrar or Numbers 8 and 10, where all Israel laid hands upon the Levites 
to designate them as surrogates, right? Bimar, Bimidbar 27, God commanded Moshe to lay his hands on Yehoshua, thereby appointing Yehoshua as a new leader. Moshe invested Yehoshua with his authority and he became Moshe's substitute. In Judaism, elders, judges, and rabbis receive ordination through the ritual of laying on of hands. The apostles conferred the Ruach HaKodesh by the laying on of hands. They ordained elders and deacons through the laying on of hands. They considered laying on of hands as one of the elementary doctrines of the messianic faith. And we do the same in our congregation today, don't we? We even lay our hands on people that we that want the gifts that we may have. In each of these instances, the laying on of hands symbolizes investor. Yes, ma'am. We used to do that when I when they made me Shah Machine years and centuries ago, they laid hands on me. They don't do it. You don't do it anymore. Coming up. Coming up. Coming up. The gun. Coming up. Oh, hey, I didn't jump. No, no gun. There was no, I didn't see no laying hands on Shaw machines for several years. Well, hide and watch. I've been looking. Hide and watch is coming up yeah. on the horizon. Or I'm going to call you up and lay hands on you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the way he said that. I used to tell my kids, I used to tell my kids, I'm going to lay hands on you too, right? When a man leaned his hands on the head of an animal, he invested his identity into the animal. Again, if we refer back to chapter 1, verse 4, we see that the Torah instructed the worshiper to lay his hands, to lay hands on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement. Now, again, yeah, we might assume that the sacrifice meant as an atonement for sin, but again, it's not the case. The word atonement, kafar, certainly implied the forgiveness of sin and the removal of guilt, but, excuse me, the word meant more than just that. The word, the noun form of the word, you know, Hebrew has the verb form of a word and it has a noun form of the word. And the noun form of the word means ransom. Ransom for one's life. <clears throat> it's helpful to think of a kafar as an act of purgation. Now that's another big word, right? In a sense, atonement involves purging of elements that offend the deity, sin, ritual impurity, and any other ceremonial or moral defilement that creates an obstacle into the presence and the communion with God. Without this purging, a human being cannot draw near to God. Without purging of the sanctuary and the holy things, the presence of God could not remain within the Mishkan. Without this purging, a human being cannot draw near to God or into the sanctuary and the holy things. Absolutely. Now, the same is true with the worshiper who draws near to God. Man, God's manifest presence within his place. God is dangerous. Did you know that? And to draw near physically to his manifest presence is dangerous. The sacrificial system was meant by those who desired to draw near could do so safely, albeit through the agency of surrogation on his behalf. Now, in view of those concerns, we should understand Levitical or Vayikra atonement as a covering, a protective shield, just like the, the spaceship, right? In the sense, it's a protecting shelter from the manifest presence of God who occupied the Mishkan in the temple as a purging of elements that present an obstacle in our communion with him. Now, there's a parable, and we all know it. I think the book of Hebrews tells us that the sacrifice was for a cleansing That's of right. the flesh. The flesh alone. So, and, and it's just what we say. So the flesh 
because you're attached to your flesh. So your flesh can yep. go into the presence of God no, no, without, can't. without being consumed. So that's what that sacrifice right. was for, was for your flesh, for your carnal. Right. Pardon me? The mikvah as well? Uh, yeah, the mikvah well, as well. Yeah, for the cleansing of the flesh. It wasn't for anything so else. We have to understand that your flesh, even as a believer, you cannot go into God's presence uh -uh. uncovered right now. Even as a believer, you've got to be covered. And of course, we oversimplify that by saying, well, I'm covered in the blood, which is true. And that's why we're not consumed. But we're also not consumed because look around at the whole church worldwide. God hasn't poured out his no. fullness of his power yet. If if he came on a Friday night to pour out his, the fullness of his power, we'd all, there would be nobody left we'd standing. We'd all be consumed. We would all be consumed because we're not committed enough. We're not covered enough for that. The flesh could never withstand it. Yes, sir. Since, yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. Since we won't let the space shuttle analogy go, I just <laughs> want to remind you, the tiles failed and the EPA yes. made them take, um, um, take a chemical out of them. Uh -huh. yeah. or, 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 or. Well, you know, the thing... That, that's a very good analogy. I want to be careful about crafting in the presence of God. I'm yeah. Sure well, and but it's a very good analogy. When you take when you take the Ruach HaKodesh, which is our seal, correct? It seals us. When you take that out of our relationship with God, we have no protective shield. Freon. Freon, okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, when we when we go to prayer, okay, this is just a natural thing for me, whether it be right or wrong for anybody else. But because he is so holy, he is so pure, and his love is so wonderful, um, we we have to approach him with clean hands yes. and a pure heart. So we confess and we cleanse to come before to come before his presence. And it's it, I never twenty years ago mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Okay, but as I grew into that time of cleansing. It is so important that we take that time to cleanse. We just don't walk in and say, oh, hey, Lord, I'm here. You know, it isn't that way. No, it's 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 it's, it's the cleansing of the heart of your spirit to come before him. That's what we did uh, in, on the first of Nisan. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. The cleansing of your temple. Yes. Even though you're washed in the blood of Messiah, you still need to be. Cleansed. We still have flesh. Absolutely. Well, you know, and the thing about we have so many opportunities, and I think that we as a body, uh, don't really think about it. That every time, every Shabbat before Shabbat, we have an opportunity to repent and to purge of sin because we're coming into his presence. Right. Every Moedim. I mean, God says, oh man, oy vey, I know these people. I'm going to give them all of these Moedim and I'm going to give them all of these because they've got to stay pure and purged before me. And sometimes we don't take that as, as heavenly or as heavily as we should. Yes, sir. I think a lot of times we are lazy. And oh, I know we are. There's no doubt about it. How about yeah. always? <laughs> well, <laughs> lazy the is. Profound experiences I've had is in a sweat lodge. It, sweat lodge. It's, it's a, oh, it's a sweat, an Indian sweat, sweat lodge, lodge. Yeah. Native American sweat. It's it, it is so profound. It's not like you just pray for. This is an all day event. Mm -hmm. You know, hours of preparation. You know, hours of the process. Hours of what goes on. It's an entire day's event, and it's all about preparation, purification, and coming before the creator with your request. And I, I think if we were to take more of that kind of a mindset, I, I know it's difficult and impossible for most people to go through something like that or to participate in that. But but it, it's it's a it's a It, it, it's a good thing to understand and um, 
anyway. I think any time, uh, Gary, I think any time that you consecrate a specific period of time, whether it be two hours, whether it be a day or whatever it be, you consecrate that time and that you divest yourself of um, TV. You divest yourself of, of uh, Lord, I'm just going to spend this time with you. That when you divest yourself of the things of the world, I think God works in an amazing way. And he brings you closer and closer and closer to him. And, in, and through that process, not only do you become closer with him, but he becomes closer with you. But we as busy, busy Americans today, you know, even when we say, well, we're going to do this, you know, we're going to do that. We do it on the fly. We do it to check it off the box. We say, well, okay, I'm, I promise I'm going to read every day. So I'm not going to read. I'm going to put it on the speaker so, or put it in my ear so I can do something else while I do it. And I don't think we have that focused dedication to our purpose. Yes, sir. Um, the next one is not supposed to be once a year. No. And, and first John is supposed to be like uh, multi-daily. Right. And I put on my shower um, mikvah, wash away the sins of the world. There you I go. Mind every morning. And this morning it worked all the way until I got in my truck and couldn't get out of my driveway. Now I got to do it again. Now you got to do it again, huh? <laughs> because, <laughs> right, absolutely. Absolutely. So let me see where I was. Uh, in the sacrificial context, oh, uh, the uh, animal's death provided no atonement or communion. These things existed in the life, in the blood of the animal. Sacrifice is about life, not about death. Oh, I'm sorry. In the sacrificial atonement, does not mean attainment of salvation. The burnt offering could only be brought with great joy of heart. Okay. See, when a man leaned his hands on the head of an animal, he invested his identity. You know, the sacrifices and the temple rituals had to do with drawing near to God within his holy precincts in this present world. The writer of Hebrews makes this very clear in chapter 9, verses 13 through 14. Again, just like Pastor Bruce said, he argues that if animal sacrifices were officious as regards to the flesh, how much more so is the sacrifice of Messiah? In regards to the spirit, it reads, for the blood of goats and bills, bulls, and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Mashiach, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, we need to notice that the writer of Hebrews readily concedes that the blood of goats and bulls didn't cleanse the defiled, right? And they, they didn't sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more than would the blood of Yeshua cleanse us? You know, the temple sacrifices sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. They did nothing to cleanse the eternal soul. Got to remember that. We want to tie the eternal soul with the Mishkan, and it isn't, right? That, that, that could be accomplished only by faith and repentance. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have always thought of this. I can't find a, a solution. How did three, two, three priests take care of 600,000? Was the sin of the community taken care of on Yom Kippur, or they didn't come in one by one? Save two that. Two? Save that for that next parish show. Yeah. Well, I'll be <laughs> dead by then. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Aha! Trap! Trap! Right? Right. Likewise, the sages say that neither the sin offering, nor the guilt offering, nor even the Day of Atonement 
can bring can bring expiation without repentance. There is no amends and recompense without true repentance. You know, in Vayikra 1.5, we read, and he shall lay the young bull before the Lord and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall offer up the blood and sprinkle the blood around on the altar that is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Well, how did the sacrificing bring the Israelites near to God? How did the sacrifices work? You know, let's just look at it very, very briefly. In the Torah, oh, the offerer, not the priest, did the actual slaying of the animal. A priest oversaw the slaughter and caught the animal's blood in a basin. The well, in, even in the temple. Oh, they, they went by numbers. Well, the priest then carried the blood to the altar and splashed it on the four sides of the altar. Right. In the Torah, blood contains the living soul of a creature. Whether human or animal, we all possess a living essence. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Torah refers to this life four as our nephesh, right? A word that we translate as soul, soul, but it does not necessarily mean the mean the divine soul that lives on after death. That's a different one, right? It's a nashima, right? The nephesh can simply refer to a spark of life that animates our flesh. It's our person, our personality, our personal identity in the flesh. The mystics call it the nephesh chaye, or the animal soul. The blood can be said to contain the soul because one's blood spills from his body, his life leaves with it. In that respect, the Torah uses the word nephesh in the way that we sometimes use the word life. Okay? Life is in the blood. By Ikra 1711, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by means of which the life that makes atonement. As this priest splashed the animal's blood upon the altar, he actually applied the animal's nephesh to the altar because the nephesh is the blood. That's what animates our body, correct? Because of the laying on of the hands ritual, the Lord regarded the animal's blood or its soul as the worshipers. It's to say in God's eyes that the priest splashed the blood of the man bringing the sacrifice on the altar. In God's eyes, the nephesh of the man was applied to the altar. Now, just think about this for a second. Everything, that life of the man was given up, to be laid on the altar before God. He couldn't do it or he'd die, correct? But his representative gave his life so that he could draw near to God. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was the nephesh of the animal mm -hmm. that ascended That's right. to God. Just like our phrase ascends That's right. to God. So he would lay his essence. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm always saying, too, when you read the word, stop nitpicking at the letter of the law that brings death you've got to go for that's the right. essence of what's being said right and because the essence is is the right. equivalent of nephesh you just so, stole my thunder i'm sorry so the, <laughs> so the nephesh ascends to god and there it is coming close right. to god being brought close to god symbolic it's symbolic, symbolic yes no life in the blood nope. the other one. No, no, but even our praise and worship is symbolic. Right. I mean, you're not ascending to God. Yeah, right. So your essence is what's ascending to God. And it's all symbolic. And that gets us into trouble too, because symbolism can mean so many different things. And it means something different outside of culture and, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know, that kind of thing too. In the ancient world, People considered altars as a touching point between heaven and earth. An altar would work as a gate, a portal, a sort of mystical portal, right? Between the realm of man and the realm of the divine. Whatever touched the altar became holy, ritual, set apart, designated for a specific purpose to God, and it entered into his presence. 
from on top of the altar, the bodies of the sacrifices ascended in the smoke to God. Through the medium of an animal's blood, the offerer's soul symbolically entered the presence of God. In short, the soul of the worshiper came near to God in his holy place. The sacrificial substitute overcame the problem of approaching a holy God. Now, according to this interpretation, the purpose of the sacrifice was not the death of the animal. The korban was about life, not death. The death of the animal only provided the means by which the life force of the animal might be procured for us in this blood ritual. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been trying to study the soul for many, many years, and I still don't know exactly what it is. And we're told in scripture that our spirit, when we die, ascends back to heaven to the source that gave right. it. But we're not told about the soul. Mm -mm. And um, I'm reading some books that explore certain things. Um, one of them is the transference of a soul from one person to another. And it's not... Um, it's not reincarnation? Not reincarnation. Because the spirit is unique to each person. Soul transference. So mm -hmm. transparent. Yeah, it's very big and cold. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, have you read about it? Have you thought about it? Is it possible? You know, I to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think it's possible. I don't think God says because he created each one of us. He knew us before, you know, we were even existed. He knew us before the foundation of the world. Um, I don't think that. Uh, I think that our souls are the essence of who we are. Is our personality is that, and I think that, I think that when we are reunited, we are reunited with our soul and body, and that's just my opinion, because it's our heart, because it's our seat of emotions. It's it's the essence of who we are. Yes, ma'am. So then, what's the difference between like a soul and a spirit? Oh, our soul is makes who makes us what we who we are. It's our personality, it's uh, it's our uh, it's our identity, it's our our. Uh, I mean, it's it's we're just a flesh, we're just a body, we're just a hunk of meat. I, I know that sounds terrible. That's all we are. But what makes us uniquely you and uniquely you, because you're both li living in just a hunk of meat, that's our soul. And that's my opinion. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we we kind of we kind of define it as the soul is the mind, mm -hmm. our will, and our emotions. Yes, it's that human part of us. It's who we are, our personality. But that's why, but but that's why we have to renew that mind and yeah. choose and will to follow after God because it's corrupt. Our soul's corrupt. Our flesh is corrupt. But our spirit is the spirit of God that lives within mm -hmm. that place in our spirit, and it can't be touched by the enemy. And it, that is the part that is that is in the position of, right. with God. Right. It's the difference between our position. Okay, I've got to think. Through, our position and experience. our experience. Exactly. And our soul is our experience. Uh, yeah. The Native Americans have a really good saying. I have two dogs living with, within me. I have a black dog and I have a white dog living within me. And whenever I would do something I shouldn't be doing, my great grandma would take me aside and she'd say, Carol, you have two dogs living inside of you. You have a white dog and you have a black dog. And I'd look at her like, huh? And she said, the one that you feed the most is the one that's going to win. And your bad dog or your, your black dog is the one that wants you to do the things that you shouldn't do. And the white dog is what tells you this is God's telling you. So which one is going to win? Yes, sir. Think, think of it kind of like this. Kind of like it's simple. My soul is what I am. My spirit is who I am. Soul is kind of like what I am. My spirit is who I am. Who is defined by 
my life experiences and choices that I make, similar to the two dogs. Yeah. Okay. And the the, the soul is is the essence of what I am. It's 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 you know it's it's a dichotomy of and I, I think they're so separate yet entwined it's difficult to differentiate but basically the soul is one of my professors in college says you know does man have a soul and everyone go yeah 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 and he goes no because if you did you take it out to play with it <laughs> it is what we are yeah. Man became a living soul. When God breaks into you. Yes, it's, it's, it's an entity sort of state. And then as I grow, live, learn, and the choices that I make turns me into what I become. And life is all full of choices. And if I choose to accept Christ and follow that, then that dominates my life's journey. If I reject it, that dominates my life's journey. If I accept that, then I find myself in a war of wills as what my flesh wants, what my spirit wants. Peter said that identically. He said, I do the things I do not want to do, and I don't do the things I want to do. Yeah. He had that that conflict between his spirit and his soul. And that's the same conflict that we have today. We're no different. See, I hate that meat. Uh, it, 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 it drives me down. From, from a military standpoint, okay? I've got the enemy in my own camp that knows me better than I know myself. And there's nothing I can do to get rid of it. You know, it's always there. It's it seems like like the flesh never weakens, but it it wears down the spirit, you know, and that constant struggle, that constant battle, you know. It's like one of, one of my friends that I grew up in my youth group said, Well, I want to die young, so I can look back at my corpse and say, Hope you rock. <laughs> It's, it's it's the thing that holds us back. You know, it's we really have to stop and think too, because we can get into this big thing about soul and spirit, and, and the, but we know that our soul is still tied with our flesh, and our spirit is not, because we have been given a new spirit. Correct. We no longer have the spirit of this world. We now have his spirit dwelling in us. And just like that lets us come into his presence, that's a seal. Whereas just as the animal allowed us, allowed man to, through um, a vicariousness, the blood then ascended, the offering then ascended and allowed the offerer to give is that soul within us. You know, we say our soul moans with words that we cannot even understand because we have that connection that way. So when we lay our, our lives on the altar, which we do, we should be doing every day and twice a day. Sometimes I have to do a lot more than that, right? When we lay our lives on the altar, we're saying, Lord, Lord, I am all yours. I am all yours. Connect with me because I did this, I thought this, or whatever. And so that's a constant thing. You know, according to the, again, this is not about law. It's about life. It's not about death, right? Now, the human beings desire to draw near to God, but sin and mortality create an obstacle between us and the Almighty. That's what we've been talking about, correct? We cannot approach the holy God, much as Moshe could not enter the Mishkan at the end of Book of Shemot. We, too, cannot enter into God's presence in our present condition. He's holy again. We're, we're common. He's immortal. We're mortal. He's pure. Again, we cannot come to God without a korban, something brought in our stead. And this is where it should roll our socks up and down. The Torah told the children of Israel to bring an unblemished animal for the korban. 
the sacrificial koban vicariously brought the worshiper into the presence of God. Our holy master is our korban for the eternal sanctuary above. And that's your fill-in. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeshua brings us into the presence of the Father. I missed that, didn't I? Nope. Okay. But again, our holy master is our korban of love for the eternal sanctuary above. He's the unblemished, perfect, and sinless one that brings us near and into the very presence of God. No man comes to the Father except through Yeshua. Through his son. Yes. Drawing near to God within his holy precincts in this present world. I went right over that. Even my red, I went right over them. Okay. A, Yeshua brings us into the presence of his father. <laughs> and our holy master is our korban for the eternal sanctuary above. By confessing his name. Yes, sir. Is this this is your first part, but no. How do you mean your first um, mid wrap? Right? No. no. Oh, okay. Uh, um, all right. I just gonna want to make sure. I want to make sure you didn't finish your notes. This is the first one. No, I, I just no. No. <laughs> I'm on time, and I've got some more important things because I am skipping forward. So it's not like I've got to dump it all at once. Yes, ma'am. So if we have a covering. We can enter into the holy of holies. No, I didn't say that. I said into the into presence, the presence of God. Our spirit is taken through our mediator, who is Yeshua, our Messiah. I personally, personal opinion, I don't think we'll ever be able to enter into the presence of God. I don't think we will. We will never be able to. Huh? We'll get as close as we can because of his sacrifice but i don't first again i don't think that that's my personal opinion so thank you i that means a lot right uh, our holy master is our korban for the eternal sanctuary above notes Though the blood of the bull allowed man to draw near to God's presence in the earthly Mishkan and the tabernacle, it did not avail him the same privilege in the true tabernacle in heaven. Through Yeshua, his disciples, his Talmudim, will draw near to God. And I said near to God in the heavenly temple and in the world to come. So read, if we're going to read Hebrew, can I, I've got about five minutes. Is that okay? Okay. That's, okay. that's okay. I just didn't want people to get antsy. And I, Mary, I said that, then I looked at you. Duh. Okay. So let's take a closer look at what the letters to Hebrews tells us. Hebrews 1 to 2 says, For the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have a consciousness of sin. And then Hebrews 7, 19, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Hebrews 7.25, because of this oath, Yeshua has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since the death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Yeshua lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede. Hebrews 4.16, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You know, that's the amazing thing. He experienced every temptation that we did, 
But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Oh my gosh, that should just send chills up and down you. But we can approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, since we have confidence to enter now, the most holy place by the blood of Yeshua. Now, we enter by his mediation. I don't think we're going to go in there. I think we go through him vicariously. Right? By the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way opened up for us through that curtain. And those that study the Mishkan know that when you enter the curtain, you're entering through Yeshua. The pillars, the, the, the tapestries are all symbolic of the mediation that we have. We have a great priest. Oh, he opened up by the bloody Yeshua by a new and living way, opened up through us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full of assurance. Oh my gosh, there's another tingler. Full of assurance of faith because having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. Yes, ma'am. Just reading Hebrews, it makes it really difficult for me to come to the conclusion that we're going to go back to the sacrifices. It's making everything so clear here that Yeshua is in the order of Melchizedek. Um, and and it's, yeah, it's it, once... <laughs> He, he entered it once for all. And so for me to conceptualize going back to the old way, I, I, I can't do it. I think that there are, uh, I agree with Pastor Bruce. I think there's going to be two. There's going to be a, line, a, a, a lineal uh, a parallel. path, parallel path. There you go. A parallel path. Because there's going to be those that haven't accepted Yeshua that will still be alive. They will have lived through that period of time because we know it says there'll still be weddings, there'll still be births, there'll still be death, right. And those of us that have been taken up, I don't think that we're going to be having marriages. No. And I don't think we're going to be experiencing death because we've already experienced, right? right? So I think that there's going to be two ways. I think there's going to be people saved that then will step into the other line, so to say. But I think there's going to be people that haven't. And they're still going to have to have a covering. They're going to have to, 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 to have some kind of way to exist. And that may be one of the things that, you know, I have a book that I write in, my journal, and I put questions in there. And that might be, that's one of the questions I'm going to ask him, Lord, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. You know, it, like, did Adam have a belly button? <laughs> you know? No. It, it's, it's, you know, I don't understand this, Lord. You do. So when I get there, can I ask you? But I, when we get there, it's not going to be not going to be relevant. As, um, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but um, I'm going to get file on with Sharon. And um, we're using circular thinking. Uh -huh. If our premises are wrong, then our conclusions are wrong. Uh, most of us think that we were wrong about the rapture, even though it was taught by the best teachers in um, Christendom. Okay, so I don't see anything in the Book of Ezekiel that talks about a future temple, talks about a temple that's devoid of life, temple that uh, is full of judgment, destruction, no presence of God. That's exactly what we had in Herod's temple. And if, yeah. if I'm correct, and I'm going to change my mind tonight, okay, then the sacrificial system in the millennial, millennial temple, temple is no longer needed. That, you know, that will be probably a topic of discussion until the Lord comes. It's one of those hidden mysteries 
Yeah. Well, that could be too. Yeah. But God's going to have to open up the door and give concrete knowledge and wisdom to someone, you know, to, to be able to discern that and then to be able to show others that. Um, but that's one of the questions. Put on your book, you know? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. I don't know. I'm just, this is just in my thinking right now, but when we, when we are, when we are up there laid to rest and all that and our souls and everything, speaking of husbands, are we reunited with our husbands? Like our no. Husbands? No. Oh. no, 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 no. Okay. So, and I can, and I can say praise God, right? We go to be, I, mean, I, I can say that. I can say praise God for that. No, but we, I, I personally believe that we'll be able to recognize people. But I mean, what if, because the 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 beggar recognized Abraham, you know. So I I kind of believe that I've got I've got seeds sowed. I've planted a family already that I will be reunited with. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir, ma'am. In answer to your question, this might make it a lot simpler. Um, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I really don't. You see, when, when we all first get up into heaven, there's an orientation class. <laughs> oh, no. Did Maria answer that? And no, and you can you can ask as you, you can ask as many questions. You submit your you questions want. beforehand. <laughs> and basically, to dispel all, a lot of our false assumptions, this, that, whatever. It's like, okay, sit down, moron. Let me explain. <laughs> and you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna sit there and go. Uh, it was so simple, and I didn't see it. And, it. and it's gonna be kind of like the when the light bulb keeps coming on. But there's a whole orientation packet. It's all, it's all in sections, Carol. Okay. Like I like that, that. that absolutely. And they, they come with an objective. It, they go yeah. through it. Teacher. And, and the teacher and your, your your guardian angel right there kind of yeah. answer some of your more personal questions it's going to take some time because you know we have a hundred years we have a thousand years but and i can i can just see i can just see the guardian angel going it, it's <laughs> it's it, it's it's actually it's actually it's actually a one thousand year class but it goes by in a day <laughs> You know, and if we if we knew absolutely everything, would there be trust? There'd be nothing to learn. You know, or would we say, "Yeah, we have." To, boy, can you imagine midrash in heaven? <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, he's yeah, he's, no, your show's going to say, "Okay, heads up, Nimrods, right? Heads up, let me tell you, right? Absolutely." And you know, it's going to have to go. Oh, the highlight of the class. Get a tour of the universe. Oh, yes, now, sir. Yeah, you know, again, I was, I was wondering, maybe I missed it, but how was, how did the average Israeli, how were they empowered? How were they, uh, how did they approach God? Uh, because God said he was disgusted with them. Right. Uh, over and over and over. They were disobedient. So uh, my thinking is, is that how did they approach God? They must have. Uh, somehow, uh, it just wasn't the priest. No, no, and it was uh, well. The priest stood as an intermediary to the people, just like Yeshua stands as an intermediary for us. Correct, and the Jews screwed up so many times, and God is so gracious. But it's through that. We, remember, I read that, that with there is no atonement, there is no. Um, uh, without the shedding of blood and without remorse and without um, uh, repentance. And I think that's the whole thing, because if you look back on the history of the Jews, you know, it's there's, you could have almost cookie stamped what they were going to do. God favored them. They prospered. They had this amazing land. You know, they were well known in all the world at that time. And you know, pretty soon they got to think it's all about me and a bag of chips. And they said, well, you know, look what I'm doing. Look what we're doing, you know, all of that. And God said, look, I'm going to send you a prophet. And they're going to tell you what you're not doing and how to get back to me. And we see that in the book of Hosea. And we see that through Ezekiel. And we see it through all of them. And the people said, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Look how much God has blessed me. 
look how much God has blessed us. We're his chosen people, da, 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 da. And finally God says, okay, I've had it. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to actually, I'm going to take my hands off of you. I'm going to leave you to your own circumstances. And he does that with us today. I mean, how many of us have had God take his hands off of us? And we, we say, oh boy, did I mess up, right? And he leaves them to their own circumstances. And then he come, brings somebody back again and they say, no, we better shape up here, ship out. They repent. And it's all, it starts with repentance. And repentance is a genuine, heartfelt remorse for what you've done. And it's a turning away. You know, we use the word uh, teshuva, right? And we say, well, I'm repenting, it's teshuva. No, 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 no. That word, and if you study our Hebrew class, that word means a man walking dirty, heavy with sin. And he walks into the presence of God. He's all bowed down, bent over. He's walking into the presence of God because of this heavy, heaviness on his, his burden. And he sees God. And he falls on his side in a complete uh, position of surrender. He gave up everything. He's surrendering. He's laying on the ground. Be like us when we supposedly us when we when we. Um, um, okay, guys. Yes, when we prostrate, right? Prostrate, not prostrate. And we lay there. And then God says, "Okay, I forgive you." And this man stands up and he offers his whole being to God. And I think that that's what has to ha had to happen in the tabernacle in order for him to be, to be back into the proper position with God. And it can only be done through the atonement and it's done through the laying on and the appropriation of the blood of the animal on the altar. The man could not lay his own blood on the altar. You know, we can't say, Lord, I messed up and I'm gonna to die to myself and I'm gonna give myself up to you. We can't, you know, we can say that, but we don't do it because we cannot die on the altar, right? But the animal can vicariously take our identity to the altar. And that's what Yeshua did. He vicariously took each of our identity and he laid it on the altar. Those that believe in me, right? And he laid that on the altar for us so that we then identify with him just like the, the man identified with the sheep. And I don't know if I answered your question. I tried to. Well, I, 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 I'm just, I've always been curious as to know how did the average uh, Israeli or you know, farmers or whatever. I mean, how did they go about their daily lives to oh. have any kind of sense of God? I see what you're saying. I mean, what was, <clears throat> uh, how were they empowered? Uh, I mean, they had, uh, we know there was faith that, that I hear that, but I, I just didn't know how, I mean, the priests and, and right, the, right. The, the Levites, they are all involved in this. But I mean, the average person, I mean, today we have a we have a sense of approaching God. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how is it, how did they go along in this so that God could be upset with them? Mm -hmm. They had they had a conscience, mm -hmm. I guess, to understand right. what's right and wrong, but how were they, uh, how did they bring themselves in, in conform to God? You know, I think that's what I think the book of uh, Shemot and Davarim is so much about. We have lost in our society, in a modern society today, we have lost the awe of the creator. We have lost the awe of the creation. And, you know, man, the dumbest man in the world knows that there is a supreme power because he lives in the world that God created him. And we don't have that today. You know, it's like we've taken our brains out and played with them. Because if you, if you rely upon nature, if you rely upon the goodness of the rain, if you rely upon the goodness of the soil, if you rely upon, you know, the the animals for food, if you rely on those things, you're relying on something beyond and outside of yourself. And we today don't. We're a nation that says, I can do it all. I'm all that in a bag of chips. Yes, sir. Uh, to answer your question, Chris, or to give a little 
white men there. Uh, even uh, Joseph was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. He was not uh, a priest, but he taught Torah to his son. Yes. It was, it was he because Yeshua, when he came up on this earth, he gave up everything. Mm -hmm. Who taught him? His father did. Okay, so yep. let's give credit to to the Jews right. uh, that you know they knew they knew Torah, even Elijah. Right. He said, I'm the last. <laughs> and he was told, No, I've already reserved 10,000. There are other people there right. that they never gave up on the one true God. So I, I like to give credit there to the people that uh, they didn't walk away from the Lord. They kept no. it going and they kept passing it on to their children and to their children's children, which we know the commandments tell right. to do. Well, and we're told, you know, speak to your children, teach your children. But you've got to remember, this was a society that had a history of thousands of years or a thousand years of a relationship with God. And we've cut ourselves off from that. I mean, I talked to my grandson. When all the stuff started hitting the fan, I, we made uh, effort to talk to each one of our children and each one of our grandchildren. I mean, boys, you know, take a deep breath and do it, right? And I said, Kevin, what do you believe about God? I know as a child, you accepted Jesus as your savior. What do you believe about God? And he told me, Oh boy, and is there anything I'd do to walk up and lay hands on him, right? And he said to me, Nana, I've had too much school. I've had too many classes in psychology, sociology, brainwashing, brainwashing to believe that. And it's our society, parents, by not going back and saying, this is history, this is truth, it will last forever. And we don't do that anymore. We've taken it out of our schools. We've taken it out of our libraries. We've taken it off of television. We've taken it off the radio. We, we don't do it. And it's going to come to the point where there are after people that do it. Yes, sir, you, you need to close. Uh, I'm speaking to uh, Chris. Um, we started out, the, the, the tribesmen of Aryan Jaya, when told the story about Judas, Judas was the hero because the highest thing they could achieve is killing a good friend, befriending someone, and then stabbing him in the back with a spear. That's what their lifestyle was. And the missionaries could get nowhere, but they had this tradition of the peace child that was talked about. And now when they associated Yeshua with the peace child, these tribes came to the Lord in, 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 in droves. Now, now the Jews, many Jews are gonna be in heaven uh -huh. before Jesus died and rose again, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Zechariah 11 says, you know, it's the same entity that's uh -huh. doing the saving. So what, what struck me about the movie that, or the show The Chosen is how religious his followers were before. That's speaking to what right. Pastor just said. Um, they were taught in Torah. It was almost ridiculous how much they honored the Shabbat yep. and, and clean and separate from Gentiles. And the whole the, the whole community did it. So it the prepared them for Yeshua's message. Yes. Had they not had that training, Yep. Yeshua just would have been like right. the tribes. Right, off. right. And just like they were looking for the Messiah, we're looking for his second coming. And we should have that same kind of mental attitude, you know, that looking forward, that striving for. Yes, ma'am. And then I need okay. to shut up because my husband's. Okay, real quick. Um, God was not deceptive with the rabbis. Maybe of their speaking to specific only law. However, that that speaking right there is a, is a specific religion where that comes from. That being said, and the rabbis, I mean, they they were praying, they were doing, they were following the law. I mean, to the feet. It yes. wasn't that they were. He was disgusted with them. And we each year we we have that time during Yom Kippur that we are allowed to come and repent, and they did as well. And they did it before most of anybody. And Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles when Yeshua is going to come anyways. He's not going to come like during another time. He's going to come only in that time. Uh -huh. So they have, we all, rabbis and us, we all have that opportunity to ask for forgiveness oh, yeah. throughout the... Throughout the um, well, we have it every Shabbat. 
And every Shabbat yeah. is right. like, yes. Yeah. So I don't, that <laughs> means then, and that. Like well, you know, the rabbis, that. Yeshua was not disgusted with rabbis no. in any way, shape, or form. No, he, he, so they said one thing and did another. That was the issue. And if you read the book of Hosea and you read, read other books, that some of them, just like priests today, mm -hmm. I mean, come on, there are pastors today that are living off of the income of people because they think that if they believe, they believe on that pastor, they go to that church, that God's going to give them absolutely everything in the world. And if something bad comes into the world, it's because they haven't given enough or because they have sinned or whatever. And um, that's not true. That's not true. And, you know, we have to stop and think and use our brains here. Just like God is unset. I mean, I'm sure that there are priests or pastors here on this earth today that God goes, oh, my Better it be a millstone hung around their neck yeah. than they continue to mislead one of my little sheep. And I can tell you for certain, I absolutely can tell you for certain that there are going to be pastors that stand before his presence and he's going to say, ah, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. It's the legalistic, do it this way or else. It's the legalistic, um, if God isn't enough, Yeshua isn't enough, there's got to be something else. Yes, sir. A and riddle we got for an atheist. Hmm? A riddle for an atheist. Okay. Who is the one person that knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that God does not exist? Well, that's cool because if he says me, then he's admitting that there was a God, right? The only person who can say there. with absolute assurance there is no God is God himself. Uh -huh. Therefore, it is a contradiction in logic there you go. and utter foolishness where the atheist is saying there is no God, but for that to be true, I would have to be God himself. That's interesting. The last one, in other words, it's the life of the living Messiah that brings us near to God. Um, that's our twist day. Yeah.